Good morning, friends. We were on chapter 13. How the dwarfs refused to be taken in. Tyrion had thought, or he would have thought if he had time to think at all, that they were inside a little thatched stable about twelve feet long and six feet wide. In reality, they stood on grass. The deep blue sky was overhead, and the air which blew gently on their faces was that of a day in, the early, in early summer. Not far away from them rose a grove of trees, thickly leaved, but under every leaf there peeped out the gold or faint yellow or purple or glowing red of fruits, such as no one had seen in our world. The fruit made Tyrion feel that it must be autumn. But there was something in the feel of the air that told him it could not be later than June. They all moved toward the trees. Everyone raised his hand to pick the fruit he best liked the look of, and then everyone paused for a second. This fruit was so beautiful that each felt it can't be meant for me. Surely I'm not allowed to pluck it. It's all right, said Peter. I know what you're all thinking, but I'm sure, quite sure we needn't. I have a feeling we've got to the country where everything is allowed. Here goes, then, said Eustace, and they all began to eat. What was the fruit like? Unfortunately, no one can describe a taste. All I can say is that, compared with those fruits, the freshest grapefruit you have ever eaten was dull, and the juiciest orange was dry, and the most melting pear was hard and woody, and the sweetest wild strawberry was sour, and there were no seeds or stones and no wasps. If you had, known, if you had once eaten that fruit, all the nicest things in this world would taste like medicines after it, but I can't describe it, and you can't find out what it is like unless you can get to that country and taste it for yourself. When they had eaten enough, Eustace said to King Peter, You haven't yet told us how you got here. You were just going you were just going to when King Tyrion turned up. There's not much to tell, said Peter. Edmund and I were standing on the platform, and we saw your train coming in. I remember thinking it was taking the bed far too fast. And I remember thinking how funny it was that our people were probably in the same train, though Lucy didn't know about it. Your people, High King, said Tyrion. I mean my mother and father, Edmund's and Lucy's and mine. Why were they? asked Jill. You don't mean to say they know about Narnia. Oh, no, it had nothing to do with Narnia. They were on their way to Bristol. I'd only heard they were going that morning, but Edmund said they'd be bound to be, they'd be, bound to be going by train. Edmund was the sort of person who knows about railways. And what happened then, said Jill. Well, it's not very easy to describe, is it, Edmund, said the High King. Not very, said Edmund. It wasn't at all like that other time when we were pulled out of our own world by magic. There was a frightful roar and something hit me with a bang, but it didn't hurt. And I felt not so much... I felt not so much scared as, well, excited. Oh, and this is one queer thing. I'd had a rather sore knee f from a hack at Rugger. I noticed it had suddenly gone, and I felt very light, and then here we were. It was much the same for us in the railway carriage, said Lord Diggory, wiping the last traces of the fruit from his golden beard. Only I think you and I, Polly, chiefly felt that we'd been unstiffened. You youngsters won't understand, but we stopped feeling old. "'Youngsters indeed,' youngsters indeed," said Jill. "'I don't believe you two really are much older than we are.' "'Well, if we aren't, we have been,' said Lady Polly. "'And what has been happening since you got here?' asked Eustace. "'Well,' said Peter, "'for a long time, at least I suppose it was a long time, nothing happened. "'Then the door opened. "'The door,' said Tyrion. "'Yes,' said Peter. "'The door you came in, or came out. "'By. "'Have you forgotten? "'And where is it?' "'Look,' said Peter, and pointed.' Tyrion looked and saw the queerest and most ridiculous thing you can imagine. Only a few yards away, clear to be seen in the sunlight, there stood up a rough wooden door and round it the framework of the doorway. Nothing else, no walls, no roof. He walked toward it, bewildered, and the others followed, watching to see what he would do. He walked round to the other side of the door, but it looked just the same from the other side. He was still in the open air on a summer morning. The door was simply standing up by itself as if it had grown like a tree. Fair sir, said Tyrion to the High King, this is a great marvel. It is the door you came through with that calamine ten minute, five minutes ago, said Peter, smiling. But I did not come in out of the wood, and, but did I not come out of the wood into the stable? Whereas this seems to be a door leading from nowhere to nowhere. It looks like that if you walk round it, said Peter. But put your eye to that place where there is a crack between two of the planks and look through. Tyrion put his eye to the hole. At first he could see nothing but blackness. Then, as his eyes grew used to it, he saw the dull red glow of a bonfire that was nearly going out, and above that, in a black sky, stars. 
Then he could see dark figures moving about or standing between him and the fire. He could hear them talking, and their voices were like those of Calamine's. So he knew that he was looking out through the stable door into the darkness of Lantern Waste, where he had fought his last battle. The men were discussing whether to go in and look for Rishta Tarkan, but none of them wanted to do that, or to set fire to the stable. He looked round again and could hardly believe his eyes. There was the blue sky overhead, and grassy country spreading as far as he could see in every direction, and his new friends all round him laughing. It seems then, said Tyrion, smiling himself, that the stable seen from within and the stable seen from without are two different places. Yes, said the Lord Diggory. It's inside. What? It's inside is bigger than it's outside. Yes, said Queen Lucy. In our world, too, a stable once had something inside it that was bigger than our world. It was the first time she had spoken, and from the thrill in her voice, Tyrion now knew why. She was drinking everything in more deeply than the others. She had been too happy to speak. She wanted to... He wanted to hear her speak again, so he said, Of your courtesy, madam, of your courtesy, madam, tell on. Tell me your whole adventure. After the shock and the noise, said Lucy, we found ourselves here, and we wondered at the door as you did. Then the door opened for the first time. We saw darkness through the doorway when it did, and there came through a big man with a naked sword. We saw by his arm that he was a calamine. He took his stand beside the door with his sword raised, rest, raised, resting on his shoulder, ready to cut down anyone who came through. We went to him and spoke to him, but we thought he could neither see us nor hear us. And he looked round on the sky and the sunlight and the grass. I think he couldn't see them either. So then we waited a long time. Then we heard the bolt being drawn and on the other side of drawn on the other side of the door. But the man didn't get ready to strike with his sword till he could see who was coming in. So we supposed he had been told to strike some and spare others. But at the very moment when the door opened, all of a sudden Tosh was there, on this side of the door. None of us saw where he came from, and through the door there came a big cat. It gave one look at Tosh and ran for its life, just in time, for he pounced at it, and the door hit his beak, and the door hit his beak as it was shut. The man could see Tosh. He turned very pale and bowed down before the monster, but it vanished away. Then we waited a long time again. At last the door opened for the third time, and there came in a young Calarmine. I liked him. The sent sentinel at the door started and looked very surprised when he saw him. I think he had been expecting someone quite different. I see it all now, said Eustace. He had the bad habit of interrupting stories. The cat was to go in first, and the sentry had orders to do him no harm. Then the cat was to come out and say he'd seen their beastly Toshlan and, pretended, and pretend to be frightened to scare the other, other animals. But what Schiff never guessed was that the real Tosh would turn up, so Ginger came out really frightened. And after that, Schiff would send in anyone he wanted to get rid of, and the sentry would kill them. And, friend, said Tyrion softly, you hinder the lady in her tale. Well, said Lucy, the sentry was surprised. That gave the other man just just time to get on guard. They had a fight. He killed the sentry and flung himself out, and flung him outside the door. Then he came walking slowly forward to where we were. He could see us and everything else. We tried to talk to him, but he was rather like a man in a trance. He kept on saying, Tosh, Tosh, where is Tosh? I go to Tosh. So we gave it up, and he went away somewhere, over there. I liked him. And after that, ugh, Lucy made a face. After that, said Edmund, someone flung a monkey through the door, and Tosh was there again. My sister is so tender-hearted that she doesn't like to tell you that Tosh made one peck and the monkey was gone. Serve him right, said Eustace. All the same, I hope he'll disagree with Tosh, too. And after that, said Edmund, came about a dozen dwarves, and then Jill and Eustace, and last of all yourself. I hope Tosh ate the dwarves, too, said Eustace, little swine. No, he didn't, said Lucy. But don't be, but don't be horrid, they're still here. In fact, you can see them from here. And I've tried and tried to make friends with them, but it's no use. Friends with them, said, cried Eustace. If you knew how those dwarves have been behaving... Oh, stop it, Eustace, said Lucy. Do come and see them. King Tyrion, perhaps you could do something with them. I feel no love, no great love for dwarfs today, said Tyrion. Yet at your asking, lady, I would do a greater thing than this. Lucy led the way, and soon they could all see the dwarfs. They had a very odd look. They weren't strolling about or enjoying themselves, although the cords with which they had been tied seemed to have vanished. Nor were they lying down and having a rest. They were sitting very close together in a little circle facing one another. They never looked round nor took any notice of the humans till Lucy and Tyrion were 
almost near enough to touch them. Then the dwarfs all cocked their heads as if they couldn't see anyone, but were listening hard and trying to guess by the sound what was happening. Look out, said one of them in a surly voice. Mind where you're going. Don't walk into our faces. All right, said Eustace, indign Eustace indignantly, not blind. We're not blind. We've got eyes in our heads. They must be darn good ones if you can see in here, said the same dwarf whose name was Diggle. In where? asked Edmund. Why, you bonehead, in here, of course, said Diggle, in this pitch black, pokey, smelly little hole of a stable. Are you blind? said Tyrion. Aren't we all blind in the dark? said Diggle. But it isn't dark, you poor stupid dwarf, said Lucy. Can't you see? Look up, look round. Can't you see the skies and the trees and the flowers? Can't you see me? How in the name of all humbug can I see what ain't there? And how can I see you any more than you can see me in this pitch darkness? But I can see you, said Lucy. I'll prove I can see you. You've got a pipe in your mouth. Anyone that knows the smell of ba of baccy, anyone that knows the smell of baccy can tell that, said Diggle. Oh, the poor things, this is dreadful, said Lucy. Then she had an idea. She stooped and picked some wild violets. Listen, dwarf, she said. Even if your eyes are wrong, perhaps your nose is all right. Can you smell that? She leaned across and held the fresh, damp flowers to Diggle's ugly nose. But she had to jump back quickly in order to avoid a blow from his hard little fist. None of that, he shouted. How dare you? What do you mean by shoving a lot of filthy stable litter in my face? There was a thistle in that, too. It's like your sauce. And who are you, anyway? Earthman, said Tyrion. She is the Queen Lucy, sent hither by Oslan out of the deep past. And it is for your sake... For her sake alone that I, Tyrion, your lawful king, do not cut all your heads from your shoulders. Prove, proved and twice proved traitors that you are. Well, if that doesn't beat everything, claimed Diggle, exclaimed Diggle. How can you go on talking all that rot? Your wonderful lion didn't come and help you, did he? Thought not. And now, even now, when you've been beaten and shoved into this black hole, just the same as the rest of us, you're still at your old game, starting a new lie, trying to make us believe we're none... We're none of us shut up, and it ain't dark, and heaven knows what. There is no black hole, save in your own fancy, fool, cried Tyrion. Come out of it. And leaning forward, he caught Diggle by the belt and the hood and swung him right out of the circle of dwarves. But the moment Tyrion put him down, Diggle darted back to his place among the others, rubbing his nose and howling, Ow, ow, what you do that for, banging my face against the wall? You've nearly broken my nose. Oh, dear, said Lucy. What are we to do for them? Let them alone, said Eustace. But as he spoke, the earth trembled. The sweet air grew suddenly sweeter. The brightness flashed behind them, all turned. Tyrion turned last because he was afraid. There stood his heart's desire, huge and real, the golden lion, Aslan himself. And already the others were kneeling in a circle round his forepaws and burying their hands and faces in his mane as he stooped his great head to touch them with his tongue. Then he fixed his eyes upon Tyrion, and Tyrion came near, trembling and flung himself at the lion's feet. And the lion kissed him and said, Well done, last of the kings of Narnia, who stood firm at the darkest hour. Aslan, said Lucy through her tears, could you, will you, do something for these poor dwarfs? Dearest, said Aslan, I will show you both what I can and what I cannot do. He came close to the dwarfs and gave a low growl. Low, but it set all the air shaking. But the dwarfs said to one another, Hear that, that's the gang at the other end of the stable, trying to frighten us. They do it with a machine of some kind. Don't take any notice. They won't take us in again. Aslan raised his head and shook his mane. Instantly, a glorious feast appeared on the dwarf's knees. Pies and tongues and pigeons and trifles and ices. And each dwarf had a goblet of good wine in his right hand. But it wasn't much use. They began eating and drinking greedily enough. But it was clear that they couldn't taste it properly. They thought they were eating and drinking only the sort of things you might find in a stable. One said he was trying to eat hay, and another said he had got a bit of an old turnip, and a third said he had found a raw cabbage leaf. And they raised golden goblets of rich red wine to their lips and said, Ugh, fancy drinking dirty water out of a trough that a donkey's been at. Never thought we'd come to this. But very soon every dwarf began su suspecting that every other dwarf had found something nicer than he had, and they started grabbing and snatching and went on quarreling, till in a few minutes... There was a free fight, and all the good food was smeared on their faces and clothes or trodden underfoot. But when at last they sat down to nurse their black eyes and their bleeding noses, they all said, Well, at any rate, there's no humbug here. We haven't let anyone take us in. The dwarfs are for the dwarfs. You see, said Aslan, they will not let us help them. They have chosen cunning instead of belief. Their prison is only in their 
minds, yet they are yet they are in that prison, and so afraid of being taken in that they cannot be taken out. But come, children, I have other work to do. He went to the door, and they all followed him. He raised his head and roared, Now it is time, then louder, Time! Then so loud that it could have shaken the stars, Time! The door flew open. Have a good day, friends.